In April 2021, this channel posted the video that revealed that the 20th century had been abnormally cold. During the video, it was also shown that the period 1850 to 1900 was colder than more than 95% of the previous 10,000 years. However, the video did not strongly bring out just how much this conclusion radically undermined the very basis of the Paris Agreement. We will now do so. What is the Paris Agreement? The Paris Agreement is a legally binding international treaty on climate change. It was adopted by 196 parties at COP21 in Paris on 12 December 2015 and entered into force on 4 November 2016. Its goal, set in 2015, is to limit global warming to well below 2, preferably to 1.5 degrees Celsius. The implications of that goal in 2021 are a swift transition to sustainable energy, an exponential speeding up of the efforts to achieve net zero emissions. Immediate global action to phase out coal. And in February 2021, in an online lecture organised by the London School of Economics, UN Climate Change Executive Secretary Patricia Espinosa delivered a lecture in which she took stock of what she termed the continuing climate emergency, five years on from the Paris Climate Change Agreement. She pointed out what she saw as a sobering fact, that 2020 was among the hottest three years on record. And this is where the relevance of the period 1850 to 1900 becomes so important. And this is because it is the bedrock upon which the primary goal of the Paris Agreement rests. The primary goal being to limit global warming to well below 2, preferably to 1.5 degrees Celsius, compared to pre-industrial levels. But just what are the pre-industrial levels? The definition of pre-industrial levels is a core IPCC concept and is defined in numerous reports as it is here in the 2018 SR15 Special Report on Global Warming. Global warming is the estimated increase in GMST averaged over a 30-year period expressed relative to pre-industrial levels. And pre-industrial is the multi-century period prior to the onset of large-scale industrial activity around 1750. The reference period 1850 to 1900 is used to approximate pre-industrial GMST. The period 1850 to 1900 is thus the reference period or start point from which global warming is measured. To highlight the full significance of this, we can turn to the study of Greenland ice cores by Danish glaciologist Jorgen Peter Stephenson that concluded that we live in the coldest period of the last 10,000 years. Links to a short video that summarizes the study are provided here. Greenland temperatures were reconstructed and displayed. The reconstruction displayed covers the last 8,000 years. You will find the strong resemblance to the Marcot study chart that featured in this channel's previous video. Professor Stephenson says we have temperatures from about 4,000 years ago 
that were two and a half degrees Celsius, warmer on average than today. Now as we approach our time, we can see from 4,000 years ago to 2,000 years ago, temperatures had been decreasing. And at around 1875, we have the lowest point in the last 8,000 years, which is exactly the midpoint of the period 1850 to 1900. He goes on to say that other core samples confirm that the Little Ice Age ended at the coldest point in the last 10,000 years. And this is confirmed by the IPCC definition of the Little Ice Age as taking place 1450 to 1850. These findings have also been confirmed elsewhere in the Northern Hemisphere. So do data from China and measurements from North Africa. We can now return to the Paris Agreement and the statement that 2020 was among the hottest three on record. Professor Stephenson explains the huge issue which seems to be entirely ignored or not understood by the IPCC, the UNFCCC and COP26. He says, I agree completely that we have had a global temperature increase in the 20th century, but an increase from what? It is probably an increase from the lowest point we have had in the last 10,000 years. At the very least, this statement is now given context and perspective. For on record means since the period 1850 to 1900. So 2020 was among the three hottest years in the 120 years since the coldest period of the past 10,000 years. Is that really alarming or even surprising? But Professor Stephenson goes on to make an even more pertinent point. He says, and this means that it would be very hard indeed to prove whether the increase in temperature in the 20th century was man-made or it's a natural variation. He explains it would be very hard because we made ourselves an extremely poor experiment. We started to observe meteorology at the coldest spot in the last 10,000 years. So where does that leave the Paris Agreement and COP26? At the very least, and without a doubt, any measurement made from such a cold start point as 1850 to 1900 must exaggerate the amount of warming that has taken place. But much more than that obvious conclusion, based on what we have seen, it seems that while man may have contributed to the increase in temperatures of the 20th and 21st century, we cannot be highly confident that that is the case. And we can also not be very confident of how much warming is due to human actions and how much is due to natural temperature fluctuations. Now it must be said that the IPCC has, in the past, recognised this. For example, the IPCC estimated that it was extremely likely that more than half of global warming for the period 1951 to 2010 was man-made. More than half, not all of it, and not for certain. And before that period, the global warming seen around 1920 to 1940 was very likely to have had 
a mainly natural origin, very likely, not certain. And going back even further, some of the global warming since 1850 could be a recovery from the Little Ice Age, rather than a direct result of human activities. Could be not certain. And these statements all concur with the conclusions that it would be very hard indeed to prove whether the increase in temperature of the 20th and 21st century was man-made or it's a natural variation. But the latest urgent calls for actions from the United Nations and COP26 seem to have dismissed any doubts and replaced them with certainty. As an example, take the February 2021 lecture given by the UN Climate Change Executive Secretary Patricia Espinosa. Carefully guarded opinion and likelihood are now presented as sobering facts. And all of global warming, all, is now attributed to rising concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Natural variations in global temperature no longer get a mention. And this is certainly leading to dangerous and damaging calls to action, such as this recommendation by the United Nations Secretary General to cancel all global coal projects in the pipeline and end what he terms as the deadly addiction to coal. He is aware the impact this will have on jobs and communities. Nevertheless, the Secretary General is confident in making this recommendation because science tells him so. But science is not telling him so. Science and just plain common sense tells us that there is a strong element of uncertainty and doubt about the causes of the global warming of the 20th and 21st centuries and whether this in itself poses an imminent threat. But there is no uncertainty or doubt being expressed by the United Nations. And there is no uncertainty or doubt concerning the impact that cancelling all global coal projects will have on communities that depend on coal for their livelihood. The leaders of COP26 are urged to recognise these uncertainties and to temper the urgency of their objectives. Countries can transition carefully to sustainable energy in a socially responsible and well-ordered way that cares about the lives of those being impacted and the costs involved. Such an approach seems a more scientific and better risked managed way than the urgent actions currently being demanded. This is particularly the case in the light of the risks posed by current solutions.